Welcome to another lesson everyone. In today's lesson, I will discuss about heart failure in children. The International Society of Heart Lung Transplantation defines heart failure as a clinical and a pathological syndrome that results from ventricular dysfunction, volume or pressure overload, alone or in combination. It leads to characteristic signs and symptoms such as poor growth, feeding difficulties, respiratory distress, exercise intolerance, and fatigue, and it's associated with circulatory, neurohormonal, and the molecular abnormalities. Heart failure has numerous etiologies that are a consequence of cardiac and then cardiac disorders, either congenital or acquired. So this is the International Society of Heart Lung Transplantation defines of uh, heart failure. When we see the pathophysiology, the heart can be viewed as a pump, with an abrupt proportional to this filling volume and inversely proportional to the resistance against which it pumps. As ventricular and diastolic volume increases, a healthy heart increases cardiac output until a maximum is reached and the cardiac output can no longer be augmented. This is called the Frank Sterling principle. The increased stroke volume obtained is as a result of stretching of myocardial fibers, but it also increases wall tension which elevates myocardial oxygen consumption. If a cardiac chamber is already dilated because of lesions causing increased preload such as left to right shunt or valvular insufficiency, there is little room for further dilation as a means of augmenting cardiac output. The presence of lesions that result in increased afterload to the ventricle such as aortic or pulmonary stenosis coarctation of aorta decreases cardiac performance thereby resulting in depressed star frank Stalling relationship. Systemic oxygen transport is the product of cardiac output and the systemic oxygen content, and cardiac output is the product of heart rate and the stroke volume. Stroke volume is affected by afterload, preload, and the contractility, and abnormality in heart rate can also compromise cardiac output. For example, tachyaritima shortens the diastolic time, for ventricular feeding by this mechanism to cause a decreased cardiac output. In some cases of heart failure, cardiac output is normal or increased, yet because of decreased systemic oxygen content, such as secondary to anemia or increased oxygen demands, such as secondary to hyperventilation, hyperthyroidism or hypermetabolism, an inadequate amount of oxygen is delivered to meet the body's need. This condition, it is called high output heart failure, results in the development of signs and the symptoms of heart failure when there is no basic abnormality in myocardial function and the cardiac output is greater than normal. Chronic severe high output failure may eventually result in a decrease in myocardial performance as the metabolic requirements of the myocardium are not met. There are multiple systemic compensatory mechanisms used by the body to adapt to chronic heart failure. One of these is an increase in sympathetic tone secondary to increased secretion of epinephrine by the adrenals and increased release of norepinephrine at neuromuscular junction. The initial beneficial effect of this include an increase in the heart rate and the myocardial contractility, which is mediated by this hormone action on cardiac beta adrenergic receptors, increasing cardiac output. This hormones also causes vasoconstriction, mediated by the reaction on the peripheral arterial alpha adrenergic receptors and this causes blood flow to be redistributed from the cutaneous visceral and renal base to the heart and the brain. Whereas those acute effects are beneficial, chronically increased sympathetic stimulation can have deleterious effect including hypermetabolism, increased afterload, arrhythmogenesis and increased myocardial oxygen requirement. Peripheral vasoconstriction can result in decreased renal, hepatic and gastrointestinal tract function. Chronic exposure to circulating catecholamines leads to a decrease in number of cardiac beta adrenergic receptors by downregulation and also causes direct myocardial cell damage. Therapeutic agents for heart failure are directed at restoring balances to this neuroendocrine systems. When we see the etiology of heart failure, the etiology of heart failure varies with age, during fatal period, severe anemia, due to different causes, SCVT, ventricular tachycardia, heart block, severe abyssal anomaly, or other severe right-sided right heart lesion, and the myocarditis can cause heart failure. 
in prima churnionet fluid overload pda vscd equal per bunare hypertension myocarditis and other genetic and metabolic cardiomyopathic and cosert failure in full term unit asphyxial cardiomyopathy av malformation left sided obstructive lesions such as coarctation of aorta hypoplastic left heart syndrome large mixing cardiac defects myocarditis and other genetic and metabolic cardiomyopathy can cause heart failure in infant and toddler left to right cardiac shunt such as vcd hemangioma anomalous left coronary artery genetic and metabolic cardiomyopathy acute hypertension from different causes svt kawasaki disease myocarditis can all cause heart failure in older age groups in childhood adolescents congenital heart disease various forms including single ventricular heart disease rheumatic fever acute hypertension of different etiology myocarditis thyrotoxicosis and other disorders can cause heart failure when we see clinical manifestations SRF stress extremely important in making the diagnosis of heart failure and in evaluating the possible causes gradual worsening perfusion or increasing respiratory effort might not be recognized as an abnormal finding and edema which is generally absent in infants and young children might be passed off as a normal weight gain and exercise intolerance as a lack of interest in an activity uh, with family an infant with heart failure often takes less volume per feeding becomes dizzy while sucking and may perspire profusely in children's signs the symptoms include fatigue effort intolerance anorexia dizinia edema and decaf many children however may have primarily abdominal symptoms such as abdominal pain nausea anorexia and surprisingly lack of respiratory complaints orthopenia and basilar rails are variable present and edema is usually discriminable in dependent portion of the body or anasarca may present and the cardiomegaly is invariably noted a galopritem is common when ventricular dilation is advanced and the holostolic murmur of mitral or tricuspid valve regurgitation might be heard in infants in infant heart failure might be difficult to distinguish from other causes of respiratory distress and the prominent manifestation of heart failure in infant include tachypnea feeding difficulties poor weight gain excessive respiration irritability weak cry and nausea labored respiration with intercostal subcostal retraction as well as flaring of adenazi and the sign of cardiac induced pulmonary congestion might be indistinguishable from those of bronchiolites and the wheezing is often as a more prominent finding in young infants with heart failure than rails pneumonitis with or with atelectasis is common as a result of bronchial compression by enlarged heart hepatomegaly usually occurs and the cardiomegaly is invariably present a galopritem can frequently be recognized and the other auscultatory signs are those produced by underlying cardiac lesion clinical assessment of jvp in infants might be difficult because of the shortness of the neck and the difficulty of observing a relaxed state in such infants palpation of an enlarged liver is a more reliable sign when we see a class at the stage of heart failure new york heart association functional classification recognizes or categorizes heart failure on a scale of 1 to 4 class 1 is no limitation of physical activity class 2 is slight limitation of physical activity class 3 is marked limitation of physical activity and class 4 is symptom occur even at rest discomfort with any physical activity the rose heart failure classification was developed to provide a global assessment of heart failure severity in infants and has subsequently been modified to apply to all pediatric ages and the modified rose classification incorporates feeding difficulties gross problems and symptoms of exercise intolerance into a numeric score comparable with the nia classification for adults this is a, a comparison between nia and the rose classification rose class 1 is no limitation or symptoms class 2 is infant and in those cases they have mild tachypnea or diaphoresis with feeding and older child may have mild to moderate disease on exertion so it is almost uh, comparable except some modification for pediatric age group regarding staging the american college of cardiology and the american heart association staging system defines four stages 
Stage A is those who are at high risk of heart failure, but no structural heart disease or symptoms of heart failure. Stage B is structural heart disease, but no symptoms. Stage C is structural heart disease and the symptoms of heart failure. And the stage D is refractory heart failure requiring specialized intervention. Regarding diagnosis, the first is chest X-ray. X-ray films of chest shows cardiac enlargement and the pulmonary vascularity is variable and depends on the cause of the heart failure. Infants and the children with large left to right shunt have exaggeration of pulmonary arterial vessels to the periphery of the lung field. And whereas patients with cardiomyopathy may have a relative normal pulmonary vascular bed early in the course of the disease. So there is an image of chest X-ray of a patient with VSCD and dilated cardiomyopathy in shunt lesions. There is exaggeration of pulmonary arterial vessels at the periphery of the lung field. Fluffy perihelar pulmonary marking suggests venous congestion and acute pulmonary edema, and they are only seen with severe degrees of heart failure. Cardiac enlargement is often noted as an expected finding on chest radiograph performed to evaluate for a possible pulmonary infection, bronchiolitis, or asthma, because in infants, wheezing is the most common presentation of asthma and also that of heart failure. So sometimes we do chest x ray by suspecting asthma, bronchitis, and other complications, and we find huge cardiomegaly, and we go for uh, cardiac evaluation. The other is ECG. ECG is the best tool for evaluating rhythm disorder as a, as a potential cause of heart failure, especially in tachyarrhythmias. And echocardiography is the best measuring method for identifying and diagnosing cause of heart failure. Ventricular function is quantified by echocardiography by determining fractional shortening and the ejection fraction. The fractional shortening is determined as a difference between end systolic and end diastolic diameter divided by end diastolic diameter and the normal is 55 to 65% and the normal fractional shortening is between approximately 28 to 42 percent. Arterial oxygen levels might be decreased when ventilation perfusion inequalities occur secondary to pulmonary edema. When heart failure is severe, respiratory acidosis or metabolic acidosis or both might be present. So doing ABG is important. Infants with heart failure often display hyponatremia as a result of renal water retention and the chronic diuretic treatment can decrease serum sodium levels further. Serum B type or brain nitrate peptide which is a cardiac neurohormone released in response to or in response to increased ventricular wall tension is elevated in patients with heart failure. So sometimes if you have a difficulty in differentiating respiratory distress of cardiac from other pulmonary and other causes, we can send B-type nephrotic peptide and in cardiac cause, this B-type nephrotic peptide is increased. Regarding treatment, the underlying cause of cardiac failure must be removed or alleviated if possible. And if the cause is congenital cardiac anomaly, which is amenable to surgery, medical treatment of heart failure is indicated to prepare the patient for surgery. In contrast, if the cause of heart failure is cardiomyopathy, medical management provides temporary relief from symptoms and may allow the patient to recover if the insult is reversible. If the insult is not reversible, heart failure management usually allows the child to return to normal activities for some period and to delay the need for heart transplantation. When we see overall general measures of heart failure management, the first one is date. Infants with heart failure usually fail to thrive because of a combination of increased metabolic demand and decreased caloric intake. So increasing daily calories is an important aspect of their management. Unlike adults, the use of low sodium formula or low sodium diet in the routine management of infants with heart failure is not recommended because these preparations are often poorly tolerated and they might exacerbate diuretic induced hyponatremia. And for infants, human breast milk is the ideal low sodium nutritional source. Most older children can be managed with no added salt diets and abstinence from foods containing large amount of sodium. The other is about rest. Strict bed rest is rarely necessary except in extreme cases, but it is important that the child be allowed to rest during the day and sleep adequately at night as he need. Some older patients feel better sleeping in a semi-upright position using several pillows. 
just called orthopenia so we should have to give them adequate pillow as patient respond to treatment restriction on activities can often be modified within the context of specific diagnosis and the patient's ability the other is about the issue of oxygen supplemental oxygen with a target of peripheral oxygen saturation up to 94 or partial arterial oxygen pressure of up to 60 mm mercury is needed for patients with pulmonary edema positive pressure ventilation may be required along with other drug therapies for those in low output heart failure positive pressure ventilation can significantly reduce total body oxygen consumption by eliminating the work of breathing and help to reverse metabolic acidosis the next is pharmacological therapy from pharmacological treatment of heart failure diuretics is the first line and the diuretic interfere with reabsorption of water and the sodium by the kidneys which result in reduction in circulating blood volume and thereby reduce pulmonary fluid overload and the ventricular feeding pressure diuretics are usually the first mode of therapy initiated in patients with congestive heart failure the other is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor and angiotensin receptor blockers those reduce ventricular afterload by decreasing peripheral vascular resistance and thereby improving myocardial performance afterload reducers might be useful in children with heart failure secondary to cardiomyopathy and in patients with severe mitral or aortic insufficiency they may also be effective in patients with heart failure caused by left to right shunts ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers may have additional beneficial effect on cardiac remodeling independent of their influence on afterload by directly influencing cardiac interacellular signaling pathways the other is chronic treatment with beta blocker beta adrenergic blocking agent introduced gradually as a part of comprehensive heart failure treatment improve exercise tolerance decrease hospitalization and reduce overall mortality the agent must often used are carvedolol with both alpha and beta adrenergic receptor blocking as well as free radical scavenging effects and the metoprolol a beta 1 adrenergic receptor selective antagonist beta blockers are used for the chronic treatment of patients with heart failure and should not be administered when patients are still in the acute phase of heart failure digoxin was traditionally a mainstay of treatment for heart failure in children but over the last two decades digoxin has lost favor uh, because of decreased use of digoxin include caution about its mechanism of action concern about toxicity and availability of other pharmacologic options beta adrenergic agonists such as dopamine dobutamine and epinephrine may be needed in combination with phosphodiesterase inhibitors such as milronon for patients with markedly advanced heart failure and cardiogenic shock so when we uh, manage a patient based on stage and the class of heart failure stage B and the class 1 is treated by ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blocker and beta blocker because of their special effect on cardiac remodeling and stage C and the class 1 to 4 is treated by ACE inhibitor angiotensin receptor blocker beta blocker diuretic allosterone antagonist and other treatment and the stage D and the class 4 is treated by all stage C medication and inotropic agent vasodilators and other experimental drugs and the surgical treatment this is all about heart failure in children thank you for watching